Well, hello and welcome to the weekly podcast from the Huffines Institute for Sports Medicine and Human Performance. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Lightfoot, and I'm so pleased that everyone took the time to download us or are tuning in uh, to see our new Ventures in Video podcast. Today we have a, a special treat for you. Today is our first uh, distance video podcast where we're actually recording um, from someone that's actually not here in our studio. And uh, I, we're really excited to have this guest with us today. Uh, so joining us today is another interesting person from the world of sports medicine and human performance, Ms. Christy Ashwanden. Welcome to the podcast, Christy. Thanks so much for having me, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, uh, well, we're so excited to have you back. I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about you um, before we get started and why we're so excited to have you today uh, on with us. Uh, those of you that are longtime listeners to our audio podcast and uh, have seen some of our videos in the past, you're familiar with uh, Christy. Uh, Christy actually was on our number 80 podcast way back in uh, 20, I have to look, 2012. <laughs> And she was one of our uh, wonderful speakers at the Hilliard discussion in 2014, uh, which we have up on our website as well. And uh, as a matter of fact, part of what she talked about at that um, uh, presentation was part of what we're talking about today, one of the reasons that we have her on. But we're really excited again to have Christy with us. Uh, she is the uh, former lead science writer at 538.com. She has won many awards for her writing. She was a uh, finalist for the National Magazine Award. In 2013, she won the Science Society Award, Science and Society Award from the National Association in Science. She has written for over 60 publications, including the, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Outside, uh, Oh, we could just keep going on and on. Uh, I would specifically recommend some of her writings about mammograms and breast cancer. Uh, that's how she came to my attention uh, way back when. That's not what we're going to talk about today, but I certainly would recommend that people go to, to her personal blog and her personal writings and to see some of the things that she's written from the, in the past. Um, Christy actually uh, brings with her a lot of human performance background. Uh, she was a state champion in the 1600 meters. She uh, switched to cycling in college where she was a champion there. Then she switched to cross country skiing where she was a pro with Team Rosignol. So she's quite an athlete in her own right. Uh, one of the reasons that we're interviewing her today is though it just a couple months back, she published a new book Congratulations. That's exciting. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and the book is called A Good to Go. Let me show it to everyone here. Good to Go. Excellent. Um, what the athlete and all of us can learn from the strange science of recovery. And that we're going to keep that book up on the screen as we go through the talk. And um, this is um, a great book about exercise recovery. And uh, now I've been in this business for, I think, 33 years. And I learned stuff in this book that I didn't know, which was really exciting. But tell me how you got into the exercise recovery. Why write a book on exercise recovery? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I have to say, initially, I wondered, you know, is there really enough material for a whole book? And, you know, of course, you can imagine where this went. Then I spent a year, over a year researching it. And then the, the question became, how do I fit all of this into one book, right? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, as you mentioned earlier, I started off as an athlete. I've sort of been an athlete my whole life. And looking back on my, you know, elite athletic career, you know, these days I'm just doing things for fun and for fitness and for health and all of that. I still get out there, um, but not, not competitively. But when I look back on my series, you know, my career as an elite athlete, what I realize is that recovery is sort of the thing that I never managed to master. And if I look back at, you know, what was it that held me back the most? And, you know, if there was something I could go back and do differently, recovery is really that thing. So I had a natural interest in this. And then the other reason is that since, I, I would say that this has happened mostly since my retirement from elite sport, um, there's been the rise of what I like to think of as sort of the recovery industrial complex, mm -hmm. which is this whole array of products and services and things that have sprung up, you know, promising, making all sorts of claims and promises to help expedite expedite recovery. And you know, I think everyone understands that recovery is important and it's not a bad thing that people are giving it, um, you know, maybe more attention than it, it's been in the past. And I think that this stuff is a little bit cyclical too. You know, there was a time I remember in the 90s where there was so much focus on volume for endurance athletes and right. just doing as much as you could. And the idea was like, you just needed to train as much as much as you could. And now, you know, I think that there's a real recognition that you actually, you know, that that's sort of backwards and you want to do the least amount of training to get the adaptations. 
that, that you're looking for. And so that's been a shift and that's good. That's right. good. Um, but I really wanted to investigate um, some of these new products and services and look at whether, you know, they were really living up to their claims, but also to look at, you know, what can athletes do to optimize recovery and to get recovery right? It, well, it strikes me that it, the exercise science world has really focused on the performance itself, the sport yeah. itself, maximizing, as you said, the training. Um, and this is kind of an area that's, I guess, become uh, very um, interesting over the last several years as people have started to look for what, what can we do outside of the exercise of the performance venue to maybe help the athlete be even better in that, within that venue. And that's certainly where this idea of recovery comes up. And you start, you talk about the recovery um, industrial complex. I mean, that's how you start your book with yeah. some of your experience with that. With that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the book starts at a place called Denver Sports Recovery, which mm -hmm. is, um, as you might imagine, it's located in Denver. And it's sort of like a gym for recovery. So you pay your money and instead of using exercise equipment, you have, you know, at your service, a whole array, basically every sort of a recovery tool and trick and modality available at this point um, <laughs> and where we're at. Um, so they have, you know, those uh, compression boots, they have contrast baths, ice baths, uh, infrared saunas, cryotherapy, uh, electrical muscle stimulation, basically any, every kind of foam roller and, and muscle roller you can imagine. Yeah. Um, but they also will pair you with, you know, a, a recovery professional to sort of guide you through that and and yeah, it was a really interesting experience that I described. That's sort of how I begin the book is, is at that place I had just finished. Uh, this was, um, I visited during a summer where I was really taking the summer to try and run a, a, the fastest 5K that I could. Mm. Um, so I had just done a race. I was tired, you know, pretty beat. And so it seemed like a really good time to try this out. Well, it's interesting. They, it's, they, as you described it and as you described in the book, they have almost any and every modality that's ever been thought or suggested to maybe work with yeah. them that they expose you to. And the beauty, beautiful thing about your book is that you want, you use that as a launching part, a, a launching pad to really talk about kind of these different modalities and do they work? Do they not? Uh, I mean, as I read the book, I kept thinking, wow, I'd like to talk to her about this and wow, I'd like to talk yeah. to her about that. And we could be here for probably three hours talking about <laughs> easily. Things. <laughs> in your book. But I'd like to start off talking about one of the topics that you, that I, people may be a little bit surprised has been, I think, overblown and overhyped is the hydration issue. Yeah. 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 It was a really, it was actually a surprise to me because, you know, I had, had really learned as most people do, um, mm -hmm. you know, from things that now I realize is, is marketing. Um, you know, Gatorade is a major sponsor of a lot of the research that's out there. And so this isn't, you know, when we think of conflict of interest, I think we often think of it, you know, we have this idea that it's just, you know, corporations or people handing over money to say, okay, we're going to give you this money and you tell us this. And that's not really how it works. You know, you have these sports drink companies and now we have the bottled water industry too. And, you know, they're sponsoring a lot of the research and putting a lot of money in, into the field. And this really shapes not just the research that's done, but what sorts of research questions get, get studied. And so what I found in looking at the research is not that hydration isn't important. It's absolutely important, and it's something that athletes should definitely be thinking about. Uh, but what's happened is we've really made it far more complicated than it needs to be. And, you know, while I was researching the book, I, I looked far and wide. I, you know, I wanted to find these examples of athletes dying of dehydration on a sports field or in a marathon, and I couldn't find any. You know, I could not find a documented case of this happening. But what I did find is at least five people have died of hyponatremia or over hydration and you know, these are cases that they acquired in, in the course of doing a marathon and so you know this message that you need to drink early and often and you need to drink beyond thirst is not just sort of unscientific it's actually quite dangerous um, but the other thing too is I, I want to be really careful here that I'm not accusing researchers of all you know being on the take and that you know this is some nasty conspiracy um, but I think that what what has happened is you know it's really easy to find things in the lab that you can measure and you can find these things, but you have to really always take a step back and ask, you know, are we measuring the things that matter and the things that are important? And so often with some of these studies, 
um, you know, what happens is you can find uh, things to measure in the lab with mild, you know, as people are losing fluids and not replenishing them, maybe dur during running in the lab or something like this, you may be able to measure something that's different. And so then you say, aha, this, this shows that we really need to hydrate more. But, you know, I talk about in the, the book, I recount this, one of their very first uh, big studies um, on hydration. Um, and Ambie Burfoot, who uh, went on shortly after that, that study to win the Boston Marathon, you know, he's doing this, this study and they're having him run on a treadmill, which in those days, these were very new things. He'd never really done that before, but they were uh, making him drink all this water, you know, under, there were several conditions and then under one of the conditions he had to drink water, you know, very frequently. And he said he felt terrible and it was awful. And he just, you know, he didn't, didn't feel like he was performing well. And it felt terrible. Um, you know, whereas, and, and in those days, people really were running without drinking. I mean, he said when he won that Boston Marathon, he didn't drink anything. You just, you just didn't. And, you know, that's probably not the, the best. Uh, well, and, people, and people forget that this is this idea of sport and everybody can do marathons and things like that. It's relatively new. I mean, it's yeah, like yeah. some of those first studies that you're talking about were only done back in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. And so people forget that we knew nothing about any of that. Yeah, and so you know you can take you can take temperature measurements and things like this, and it is true that as you exercise and are losing some fluids, um, the body temperature goes up a little bit. But this is sort of an adaptation. Like what I basically found is that our bodies are actually very well adapted to exercise and and to losing some fluids during exercise. And this is not to say that you should become dehydrated and shouldn't think about hydration, but basically this notion that you need to replenish every drop of sweat in real time as it's happening is just not that that belies the basic physiology you know we have all of these adaptations which they go into this is pretty complex and i think you really need to read this chapter um, to really get the full picture here but you know our bodies have these adaptations in order to cope with this and you know this year i understand um, that the london marathon this year was won by a woman who didn't drink anything during the race and so you know i don't think that that's the best advice for everyone but i think just this notion now we have companies that are you know selling personal hydration monitors and things like this and you know we actually have a very sophisticated hydration monitor it's called thirst but yeah. i think one of the the really important messages that i i learned and that i hope people will get out of my book is that, you know, we have all these entities marketing to us that they know more than we do and that, you know, they hold the secret. And, right. um, yeah, I think that this really discourages athletes from learning to read their own bodies and to understand, you know, you need to know what it feels like to be thirsty and, and what, you know, what that feels like and being able to read your body's own signs is, you know, I sort of come to the conclusion in the book that the most important thing that any athlete can do for their recovery and probably their training too, is to learn to read their own bodies and understand what it's telling them. And so much of this, uh, you know, marketing around the recovery tools is telling them, no, no, you can't trust yourself. We know better. And we have the secret thing and you're missing out if you're not trying this thing. You know, and so it's in some cases, recovery has become its own source of stress. And that's completely counter to the whole recovery process. You know, recovery, you know, should, it's most basic form. It's really rest and relaxation. Yeah. Um, but we've sort of lost the ability to do that. And, I, you know, I think that it's sort of a commentary on where we're at in society right now that people have to, like, relearn the art of doing nothing and learn how to relax and, yeah. you know, not be a... And, and before we get too far away from hydration, though, a couple of points. I know you and I have shared this via email. It's interesting about this idea about overhydration may be a bigger issue than dehydration. Is that starting to be taken notice of in some of the big races? I know, for example, yeah. the Boston Marathon has cut back on the number of water stations they have. Several other big races have done that as well. Because as you said, there are more people that have problem with uh, hyperhydration or um, a variety of other things that we call yeah. it to do with dehydration. Um, and so certainly uh, we want the audience to, to look at that literature, read your chapter as well, because there's some really interesting data in there. But this also, I think, reflects how science changes. Uh, and I yes. think too often we look back and go, oh, well, they got it wrong, they got it wrong. Well, I think we forget that that's the purpose of science is that we, we discover stuff and then we go along and we figure out, well, that didn't quite work or that wasn't the right thing to do. And we get more, we get more, complex with our science and we get more sophisticated with our understanding. And I think this is certainly a good example of that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think that, you know, like I said, it's not that hydration isn't important and particularly athletes that are doing a longer events need to think about it and need to plan and make sure that they have access 
you know, to hydrating beverages and, you know, you don't necessarily need to take uh, electrolytes and all that. That's a whole other story. Um, but it, it's true. There's, there's more recognition of this now, and there are races that are cutting back on aid stations. Uh, one of the really scary things about this is that the, the symptoms of hyponatremia are very similar to the, the symptoms of dehydration. And so uh, what has happened in numerous cases is someone collapses and they're actually overhydrated um, but they're, then they're giving an IV or something, you know, basically the absolute worst thing that could be done at that yeah, point. So, to them. Yeah, so it's really important that people um, understand how to recognize this and understand that, I mean, truly, it really, like, you can drink to thirst. Like, that really is the best way to do this. It really is that simple. Um, but I think that we've just gotten away from, you know, no one wants to believe, like, how can it be that simple? I've got these people telling me that I can optimize everything. And it's like, well, it's because our bodies are actually highly adaptable. And you are much better off, um, you know, drinking to thirst and, and sort of using that as your schedule for drinking than forcing yourself to drink when you're not feeling thirsty and that water isn't tasting good and you're sort of choking it down. That's a sign that you don't need it. And it, it's a dangerous thing to do. And unfortunately, athletes also will do anything to get an edge. And yeah. So able to try anything. I mean, I, you know, I love compression socks when I see people run by and, yeah. and I think about, wow, your legs must be warm, but that's another yeah. story as well. Right. Together. Yeah, absolutely. And I really hope, you know, at its most basic level, I think, you know, my, my book is sort of a, a science book masquerading as a sports book. And I really hope that people will walk away from it after reading it with a better understanding of first of all, how science works, how we get to scientific truth, truths, and the fact that, you know, very often we're wrong on the way to being right. And so when our ideas about things change, it's not, um, you know, it's not saying that science is wrong and that it's bad. It's saying that, you know, that's actually how science works. And so we have to be open to new evidence. And I think one of the dangers here with, with the sports stuff is that we get, get, everyone's looking for an edge. And so you have one tiny little study that shows something interesting. And all of a sudden, everyone's jumping on the band wagon you have products you know it's being sold and marketed as a product pro product before we really have confirmed that this is how it's working and then this sort of reinforces this whole cycle where then you know you're marketing this thing that doesn't actually work and at some point you know people either realize or we, we change our minds and then people think oh well like how do we trust science if it keeps changing its mind but you know, so I think that one of the things we need to think about here too is just sort of backing off a little bit and maybe not being so quick to jump on the latest bandwagon um, with studies. I mean, one thing, I'm sort of a statistics nerd by, uh, <laughs> you know, I was a, a data, I am a data journalist and I worked at 538 for four and a half years looking, you know, doing, so statistics are my bread and butter. But what I found is that you know, so many of the studies in sports science are very small mm -hmm. and there are good reasons for that. This isn't just a matter of people, you know, using crappy methods, um, but it means that those findings are going to be less reliable than they would be in bigger studies, and it means that it's much more important that those studies are sort of taken with a little bit of a grain of salt, and that we are careful to replicate them and confirm them and interrogate them in different circumstances before we sort of decide, okay, this is the new truth, and this is what we should all be doing, and I think that, you know, that, that maybe isn't something that has been... Um, thought about enough, but there is, this is changing, and it's, I think it's kind of an exciting time right now. I don't know if you've heard of this, Tim, but there's a new group called STORC, the Society for Openness, and I can't remember the exactly transparency, yes. but yeah. um, and it's interesting because it's, it's, a lot of it is being driven by uh, younger researchers and in the field who are really trying to address some of these methodological issues, and I think that it's a, a really interesting and important development because it's stuff that you know, these ideas that they're talking about are things that can make the science more reliable and more rigorous. It may make it, you know, more difficult sometimes to get those positive results. But I think, you know, if we're looking to serve the truth, that those are good things. And um, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, anything we can make, anything we can do to make science better is great. Yeah. I love your phrase a while ago about we're going to be wrong before we get to right. And I yeah. think certainly as people need to remember that about science. Um, and I am a little cautious about some of the things being proposed out there because certainly there are some commercial entities on the science side yes. that are pushing some of these, uh, what they call solutions. And unfortunately, I think they're trying to circumvent uh, scientific truth at times, but that's not the topic for today. Yeah. 
Um, what I what I wanted to come back to though, we talk about the people getting on the fads and the bandwagons and so forth. You have a chapter about snake oil salesmen, yeah, and supplements and recovery. Um, let's briefly talk about that because those are certainly everywhere nowadays. Oh yeah, the supplements are everywhere, and yeah, I think the the quick and dirty takeaway is there's really no good reason for athletes to be taking supplements. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so much of this stuff really turns on this idea that, you know, there may be some little secret out there that you're missing out on. And if you're not doing everything, you're leaving, you know, some stone unturned. And, That's a small you know, edge. That's right, a small that little edge. edge. And so, but these companies really exploit that. But, you know, I just haven't seen any really solid, rigorous evidence showing that these supplements are helpful. But the thing that's, that's you know, I think that the biggest detriment and why athletes should be very careful is that, you know, I talk in my book about multiple cases of athletes testing positive mm-hmm. on doping tests um, from things that they ingested via supplement and in some cases from a supplement they got from their sponsor. And I think that that sort of gets at part of the problem here is that these supplement makers are huge funders of sport and particularly in some of the sports um, that I like, endurance sports, where, you know, you don't have, you know, the same kinds of sponsors you might have in the NFL and these big, big, bigger uh, sports. So you have companies that are supporting uh, the sport, they're sponsoring it. And so there's this incentive for people to take the stuff and it's sort of self-reinforcing. So then the stars are, are pointing to it and putting it on social media and all of this. Um, but it's really, you know, there, there's not a good reason to be doing this. You know, good nutrition is really important and that should really be enough. Um, right. Right. And, this, and you've got interesting data in your book about that and some interesting stories. And I would certainly encourage people to, uh, to read your book to get that insight. Now, before we end, I do want to talk about one successful recovery yeah. piece that you talk about. That's rest. That's yes. about undervalued is, is sleep and rest. Absolutely. You know, and I think um, someone just sent me the other day, I I had gotten a negative review online. This is like a reader review said, this book is terrible. It just says you got to sleep more. And it's like, yeah, yeah, sorry. And I can tell you that I would sell probably uh, many, many more books if I were to, you know, say, oh, here's the secret and here's this thing Mm -hmm. that you need to go out and buy and do. Um, but that's just not where the, the, what the science shows. And it turns out that the most important thing that an athlete can do for recovery um, is sleep and to sleep well. And it's something so simple. We all know how to do it. But it's also something that people just uh, regularly fail to get right. And it's something that people skimp on. And we, you know, we have so many things these days vying for our attention and, and time. And, you know, but if you're not prioritizing sleep, then you might as well not be prioritizing training either because you're not going to get the most out of your training. You're not going to get that full recovery. And I can just tell you that sleeping well will make everything in your life better. Yeah. It's almost like we uh, think that during, while you're sleeping, you're not doing anything. So let's just stay up a little bit longer and we can do something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I write in the book about um, uh, researchers now have this new term called uh, orthosomnia which is for people who are you know, be- becoming so anxious about sleep and all that. But they also have this other term that I thought was really interesting, which was bedtime procrastination. And this is something that happens, you know, most in our lifestyles today, most people have to get up at a certain time. They don't have the option of you know, sleeping till noon if that's what their bodies want. Um, and so that means that it's really important that you get to bed on time, right? But people are procrastinating this, you know, they're binging on Netflix or they're looking at social media or the internet's always calling or, you know, texts and things on the phone. And so this is, you know, this is a new thing that they're talking about where people are really, you know, having trouble um, just sort of having the self motivation or or self control to go to bed at a reasonable hour. So I like that new bed, bedtime procrastination. Yeah. Remember that unfortunately I, I'm, uh, I do that way too often, I think. Um, So as as we wrap here, what is uh, the, what, what was the most surprising thing that you, that you learned as you wrote the book? Um, The most surprising thing, I think the thing that was um, maybe less, least intuitive to me, I really thought that there were going to be some things that I found that I hadn't tried, you know, that some of these newfangled things Mm. would, you know, really pan out and I expected to adopt some of these new things, but I didn't find that. What I did find is that um, I think one of the things that athletes most regularly neglect to consider is the importance of life stress in recovery. 
And that was something that, you know, I think as an athlete, I sort of understood, but I never managed to get, get right. And this is just that to your body, stress is stress, whether it's coming from your workout or from life stress. And so if you're taking a rest day, but you are experiencing a lot of life stress, you know, you're trying to catch up on all the work that you were neglecting, or you're having trouble at home or whatever it is, then to your body, it's not actually a rest day. And I think that it's, it could be difficult to recognize this, but really, you know, you cannot get recovery right unless you are managing your life stress. And I say manage, not eliminate, because we can't eliminate stress from our lives. And, you know, so sometimes it's just a matter of planning for it and sort of um, managing your response to that stress. And I talk in the book, you know, I have examples of athletes doing that. And even from my own experience, you know, learning to um, you know, deal with all of the stress of travel that is so necessary as an athlete and lost luggage and things like this. And just learning how to accept that and to shift the mindset so that, you know, I can't eliminate the stress of that travel, but I can change how I'm relating to it and how it affects me and my mood and, you know, how I'm physically feeling about it. I think one of the most important messages that I got from the book was we had to be careful about our expectations for our own recovery. Yeah. Especially as we get older, many of us continue to think that we can recover like we did when we were 15 or 20 years old. And Wouldn't it be great if we could? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had someone at my last book event, uh, someone raised his hand and he asked, you know, what do you do for recovery as you get older? And I said, you give yourself more time for it. You know, that really, that, that really is the only thing um, that you can do. But I think that the key here is just, I kind of think of it as a radical acceptance. You know, mm-hmm. you could accept that you need more rest and you can give it to yourself and so that you, you are recovered or you can be in denial and you can push yourself when you're not ready and then you're sort of just digging um, yourself uh, deeper into the hole. And so, you know, that old saying, when you're in a hole, stop digging. But so often, you know, athletes are so driven and, and I think there's this tendency to be in denial about what our bodies need. And so, you know, you can't change how you're actually feeling. And this goes with injuries and things too. I think there's a tendency to say, oh, that little twinge or that ache is just nothing. I'm going to keep going. And yeah, that's how you turn what could have been, you know, a week or two injury into a, a season ending one is yeah. by not paying attention. And I think this goes back to my larger message, which is that, you know, athletes just really need to learn to listen to their bodies, to understand the signs that it's giving to them. I have a whole chapter in the book about data and recovery tracking and all of that. And, you know, basically what science has shown is that it's very individual from person to person. You know, sometimes people ask me, so what's the formula? You know, how much recovery do I need for how much exercise? And it's like, it doesn't work that way. And even for the same athlete, you know, other things that are going on in your life can really impact um, how you absorb training. You know, for instance, I write in the book about research showing um, that, you know, college athletes during finals are more prone to overtraining and injury and things like that. They need, you know, that, that emotional and life stress um, is stressing their bodies. And so you need to, to plan for that and, and, you know, put that as part of your training plan and not just think, well, I'm having this whole week off to do, you know, or I'm training really easy and I'm doing finals. It's like, no, your body is still under a lot of strain and it, you need to recognize that. Yeah. Fascinating topic. Fascinating yeah. book. Great book. Christy, thank you for taking time to be with us today on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're more than welcome. It's always a pleasure talking with you, Tim. (laughs) Well, thank you. Uh, And I want to thank all the people that are watching uh, for being with us today and tuning in. Uh, As you know, this time of the podcast is when we always ask the podcast question of the week. And from the producer, Blake, I have been given the podcast question of um, what is the best method of recovery? And so be the first one to send us the correct email or the correct response. Uh, send it to the email address huffines at tamu.edu, huffines at tamu.edu. Be the first one to send us that uh, correct response, and we'll send you one of our nifty podcast t-shirts. Um, in the meantime, again, Christy, has been so great to catch up with you, and, con- and congratulations on the book, and best wishes on many more sales for it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And again, thank you all for being with us uh, as we work to bring interesting people in the world of sports medicine and human performance to you. And please join us uh, for the next podcast. And uh, again, thank you again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.